Welcome to Small Arms Solution. Today is a very special day for me because I get to talk about one of my favorite firearms of all time, the Beretta 92 series. The Beretta 92 series is perhaps one of the most legendary handguns ever put on the modern day battlefield. It was probably served more countries uh, than any other pistol that's out there. And it still sees use today in many countries as their primary pistol. Uh, it was just replaced a couple years ago in the US military by the SIG P320 which uh, whether that was a wise idea, we have yet to uh, just remain to be seen. But uh, many people don't know that there's a history of the 92 series. This probably goes back to around 1951 when the Italians decided they wanted to replace their very much so aging M1934 380 auto uh, semi-automatic pistols. Now, as you can see from the picture of this pistol, it was a very small, it was compact, it was 380. It did have the, uh, the Beretta top open slide design. It was single action. Uh, it did have a very low magazine capacity, but it was direct low back. So the pistol that they came out with first was what we see here, the Beretta M1951, developed during the late 1940s. Now looking at this pistol, um, it does have a lot of similarities to that of the, the M1934. However, it is 9 by 19 or 9 millimeter NATO, and it uses a lot, utilizes the facilitating or dropping locking block that is used on all the current 92 series pistols. Now, I'm only going to make some observations here, which I think are very, very logical. When you take a look at the M9 pistol, or you look at the later what would become the uh, 92S pistol. When you look at that pistol, basically you're taking a look at two other pistols. You're taking, taking a look at the modern Browning high power with the high capacity magazine. Then you're looking at the Walther P38 with having the double action, single action, the decocking uh, lever on the, on the top. And you're also using the same kind of a locking system that was done on the P38. So I think it's very logical to say that there was quite a bit of, of influence uh, of the P38 and the Browning high power. So designed for military service exclusively, it was single action only. And it also had uh, two different series. So you had the first version, which is what we see here, which was the lightweight alloy frame. And that was found not to be as durable as they had wanted it to. So they ended up switching to a second uh, series, which was the steel frame. Now, some of you will look at this and it'll look very familiar to the Egyptian Helwan. Well, the Egyptian Helwan was basically a licensed copy of this pistol. And it did have a cross bolt safety, just like that of a, of a standard hunting type gun, it had a cross bolt safety. And of course, it had the European style magazine release, which as you can see, was the button right here, and a single column magazine of eight rounds. So I'm gonna take, a, take this one apart and we're gonna show you how the inside and we're gonna start looking at how this tends to evolve. Or like the later versions, you still we see the same kind of extractor on here, which is pivoting, which means you could literally drop a round in here and drop the slide and it would not damage the extractor like with most modern pistols it will because as those uh, pickets round up, the bottom, the base of the cartridge slides up underneath the extractor. And if you try to slam it forward on a round starting in the chamber, you can eventually damage if not crack or destroy that extractor. So we have our summing latch, which will push forward. We line up the notch and then we drop that right off like so and you see we have our recoil spring assembly and now we see the traditional Beretta locking block type barrel now of course this was not chrome plated this was an original this was a blued finish now looking at the slide on here this all predates the manual safety and the decock lever on the slide it it uh, is way before we saw any of the uh, recoil or way before we saw any of the firing pin blocks. This was basically the raw pistol of that early generation. Now, these also were known to have locking block failures after extensive use, uh, but not under normal use. Now, the Italian military a little bit more uh, for as far as pistols than the U.S. military. U.S. military was more of an officer's thing, or it was uh, you know only certain types of soldiers. These were more, more issued than they were in the U.S. military, even the regular soldiers. So that locks back into place. And we also go to see, we do have our barrel that sticks out a little bit on here, which would become a uh, calling card uh, of the Beretta pistols. Now looking at the uh, frame, again, uh, you have one lever right here, which is your disconnector, which is located right here, nothing on the top. You have your uh, ejector on the front here, and you can see your locking recesses in here. Um, again, this is very early reminiscence of what we're going to be seeing uh, coming up down the road. 
Now, if you look at this pistol, some of the specifications on it, you're looking at the original 1951, 31 ounces. You're looking at the 1951R, which is the steel one. You're looking at 48 ounces. The original barrel length on the uh, model 1951 was uh, 4.5 inches. The 1951R is 4.9 inches. So the overall length, you're looking at 8 versus 8.5 inches. The next version was the original model 92 pistol. Now, I don't have one of those here to look at, so we're going to take a look at some of the pictures. Now, what we see here is quite interesting because now we're starting to see what comes to more to fruition to what the 92 F series would later series would look like, but we have some early changes. Now the first one, you still had the magazine release that was uh, the European style located on the, on the butt of the pistol. The first one we have is referred to as a step cut slide, which means we have a step cut that's right around the area of the locking block, uh, locking block inserts on the slide, which is the one we see the picture of. And that was about 7,000 of those were made. And then comes the straight side the straight slide, which we would be uh, used to seeing on the current models. They found that, that extra weight wasn't necessary, so they eventually got rid of it. They had over 45,000 of those that were made uh, without that step cut on there with a straight with a straight cut slide. It too had an open open design for as far as the uh, ejection port cover. Uh, but something else that changed was the way that it fed. No more was there to be used a ramp, a uh, feed ramp on it. Basically, when the slide would open up, the round is presented right into the chamber. So it's not basically going up any ramp, it's going straight in, which we'll take a look at that in a minute. Uh, we start looking at uh, the inside of some of these. So that was one of the things that would truly make this one of the most reliable pistols of all time. Because when most pistols have a failure to feed, it's due to that ramp. This was not relying on a ramp. So you eliminated most of those. And then also by using the open slide design, most most uh, failures were caused by some kind of obstruction uh, on, the, on the cartridge case trying to extract, trying to eject. Well, there's nothing to to obstruct it. Everything is open, so everything is able to uh, be removed without any issue, which is what made this truly one of the most reliable pistols that has ever been made. Now, it had a 15-shot magazine, and something else that you will notice, those of you who are familiar with Taurus firearms, the original PT-92 was based off of this exact design. The original Taurus factory in Brazil was originally a Beretta factory that was going to be going online for the Brazilian military. And they were gearing up to build the 92 series pistols. Well, it never came to fruition. All the Italian tools were down there. Everything was down there. So Taurus started manufacturing and they introduced the PT-92, which was in fact the original Beretta 92 series. And of course they would go on to uh, have their PT-92 AF, AFS, which basically would mean they would continue to update with the decocker and a, a manual safety, but they left it on the frame instead of putting it up on the slide where Beretta would then continue to go over to. The next version would be uh, in 1978 is the 92 S pistol which this was the first time Beretta would go ahead and use a slide-mounted safety and decocker. So basically you would have the uh, decocker as well as the manual safety. Flip it up. So you still have your basically your 15-shot your magazine with your European style here. So as we have this apart, we'll take a look at the slide. Again, we do have the decocking lever on here, manual safety. But if you look underneath here, most important thing that we have right now is missing. This is pre-firing pin block. And if you look at the left-hand side here, all that was done over here was a lever was added. It's basically the exact same mechanism, just they added a lever on here. And this was also back when they had the, the parkerized finish. You did have your live cart, live uh, shell indicator, live chamber indicator, which would stick out. You'd be able to see the red, you'd be able to feel it. So now when we would take a look at the frame, you can see we have, for use with the decocking lever, the decocking lever would push down on here and that's what would decock it. And we also have the formation of our ejector which has the notch cut in it. What that notch does is it basically makes the pistol eject pretty much the same way every, the same way every time, which means you have a nice pile of brass and it's an ejection. It's a very consistent pattern. And if you'll also notice on here, we hardly have any feed ramp, period. So we're gonna reassemble this and we're gonna take a look at this. Okay, larger barrel, larger locking block. It's been all been improved. Turn our recoil spring. So what I'm gonna take a look at now is how the cartridge feeds for the magazine into the chamber. Now, if we notice, 
the ball round is lined up directly with the chamber. Um, very little contact comes with the, uh, with the ramp at all. What this does is it gives that direct feed right into the mag into the end of the chamber, which eliminates most any kind of feeding malfunction. Uh, for the most part, in, in my years of experience, and I have well over 100,000 plus rounds uh, out of 92 series going back my entire well over 100,000 rounds. The only failures to feed I have ever had was if there was a round that was uh, underpowered and it, it, we we're having a short stroke. If we had a full power ground, I've never had any ammunition that would not feed in a Beretta. But this was a this was probably one of the most uh, next most significant enhancements that would go into the uh, next version. The next version we're going to show is a photograph. Unfortunately, we don't have one of those here. It was very hard to get one of each of these, uh, but uh, I'm still trying after all these years. Is the 92 SB1 or 92 S1? This was designed for the U.S. Air Force, and it had some additional features. Now was the most important safety feature that any pistol could have. 92 SB1 was the first version that utilized a, a passive firing pin block, which you had to pull the trigger all the way to the rear for it to disengage the firing pin block to allow the hammer to strike the firing pin and the firing pin to be able to strike to set off the cartridge. This is also the moment where they switched over to a right side, a right side uh, ambidextrous decocking lever. So we would have ambidextrous on the top uh, slide uh, decocking lever. Next was they went to a three-dot system, and this is also the point where Beretta was to move over the uh, magazine release to the American-style new system where it was going to be uh, above, behind the trigger guard. So that would be the 92 SB1 or the 92 S1. Now we come to the Model 92F. Now this particular one is a Model 92FS. Uh, we're going to talk about what the, the actual 92F was because there was one major change that we will, we will get into. 92SBF or 92F was designed for the U.S. military XM9 program. Now, several changes were made. First, you got rid of the round trigger guard to the more aggressive front. Now, some people like to say this was, uh, you know, for you to be able to use this as a support, which was, well, uh, that was never, this was just more, it was more, it was more uh, durable. Now, for this model, every pistol had to be 100% uh, parts interchangeable. We also had a changing of the, of the grip angle on here that would ensure a more positive grip. Also, the US mill spec, which is, which is required, a chrome plating of the bore and chamber. And also, a new finish was developed, the Bruneton finish, which is the finish that would be used on the 92FS forward. The US government M9 would use this Bruneton finish. It was a significant increase in uh, corrosion resistance over the standard parkerizer manganese phosphate that was used. This version was the one that was adopted by the U.S. government and would soon become the M9. Now, the M9, uh, as some of you may or may not know, uh, it was initially adopted. It was between this and the SIG P226. Both pistols went through the down select, and these were the final two pistols that went on to phase two testing, which was all the endurance testing, all the uh, environmental testing, everything. Both the SIG 226 and the Beretta 92F passed that testing. So when you have two pistols that pass, meaning both fit the requirement, now it went down to competitive bidding. Well, when it came down to competitive bidding, the, the price for the pistols for both the SIG and the Beretta were identical. What got brought out of the, uh, the, the contract was a slightly lower cost on the replacement parts and magazine. So that's all it took was one to be a little bit uh, lesser than the other. Now, the thing to keep in mind here, they did not go with the, quote, worst handgun. Both pistols met the requirement. So, again, you can't have two winners. One of them has to win. And after you have both ones that meet the criteria, now is when you go down to competitive bidding, which is how they won. Well, that didn't sit too well with uh, most of the American manufacturers. They, you know, obviously they were probably upset that it was a foreign handgun. Uh, so Smith and Wesson, Ruger, uh, all got together and they protested the testing, saying that the test it was rigged. Basically, the Brady used hand selected pistols. So they were granted a retrial by the federal government. So uh, when they went to do a retrial, none of those U.S. manufacturers even submitted guns to do the retrial. So. They pulled the guns from the regular shipments that came in as the issue pistols. They competed them again with what was there, and Beretta did one. And now it was referred to as the M9 pistol. Well, now we had procurement of the new pistol, and we had procurement of ammunition. 
Well, there were some unfortunate incidences that happened uh, with with a couple SEAL units where they were firing these pistols and the slides uh, cracked and they exited the pistol and hit some of them in the face. Nobody was seriously injured, but it was a problem. They made the announcement that, that this was happening. Uh, there was a big uh, hoopla that came about the, you know, the Department, of, Department of Defense and Ordnance and you know, he had to replace these slides after every thousand rounds to see what was going on. The, the slide was sent back to Beretta, and Beretta looked at it and said that uh, this all meets within our specs. We want to see the ammunition. Well, come to find out, the ammunition that was being used was unlike what popular people like to say. These this was, uh, you know, they were shooting some machine gun ammunition. No, they weren't. They were shooting brand new M882 ball. However, the ammunition was made incorrectly. There's a difference between 9x19 9mm NATO and commercial ammunition. On the 9mm NATO ammunition, the, the powder cup sits up higher to where the bullet is seated than the commercial does, which means you have to reduce your powder charge because that compression of that bullet being that much closer will increase pressures. Well, when Winchester loaded this first lot of M882 ball ammunition, they loaded it with the specifications for the commercial ammunition in the military case, which basically was causing uh, cartridges to exceed proof pressures. So basically, these pistols, these aluminum frame pistols, were utilizing plus P plus type ammunition, nearly you know, proof loads, on a regular basis. This same ammunition, which uh, cracked the frames, uh, the slides on the Beretta, also cracked the frames uh, on the SIG pistols. We have photographs of that that shows that as well. This ammunition was detrimental to everything, but this, the SEALs decided they wanted to go with the SIG. They felt there was a flaw in this, but... What ended up happening was, uh, after it was found out that it was the ammunition, it was not the gun, first off, Beretta sued the federal government, uh, the Army, saying for defamation, which they won. Second of all, they needed to come up with a way to prevent that slide from coming back off of the hitting somebody. So they had to develop what was referred to as a slide capture mechanism. So what, we did, what they did was they enlarged the hammer and trigger pin. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at a couple of these slides and show you exactly what that was. Right here, we have a standard M9 slide that was made by Beretta. Notice how this is smooth in this area in here. But if you go over here, you see that there's a notch cut in here. Well, what was done was added to the left side of the pistol was, this is the hammer pin. The hammer pin was oversized, so what would happen was this would travel in that track on the slide. So if the slide was to, to, to fail, this would catch on the end of that track and it would prevent the slide from exiting off the rear of it and hitting uh, anybody in the, in the face. Now this was done due to the fact that they didn't know how many of those rounds were out there. So basically this was a safety measure uh, until they got their ammunition squared away. Now the US government had to pay for this and they had to pay for the implementation of it. Uh, all M9 pistols that were in current inventory had to be uh, retrofitted for it. And all current 9mm pistols, M9 pistols would have this. And that's where we come with the latest, uh, it's to date, would be the model 92FS. S means safety, it means slide safety. So the 92FS pistol would go on to be probably one of the most popular law enforcement and military handguns all over the world. It was used by the Italian military, French military, uh, militaries all over the world, law enforcement. Uh, in the 1980s, or 85 or so, was at that time period was when uh, they were, law enforcement was switching from the revolvers to semi-automatic pistols. Well, due to the fact that the XM9 program had gone through some of the most rigorous testing ever done on a semi-automatic pistol, the law enforcement would figure, well, if it's good enough for the U.S. military, it's good enough for us, and they would go ahead and adopt it. Now, we also have to say, too, there was another powers at will, would be Hollywood. Uh, this gun got its first really good look at in the movies Die Hard and Lethal Weapon, uh, which also spearheaded the massive commercial sales of the Model 92 FS. The Model 92 FS is still manufactured to this day. Uh, they have made some modifications to the rear of the grip where they have more of an indentation in here, which would allow somebody with smaller hands to grip better, to better reach the pistol grip. They also have lightened it up a little bit with making a little more of a, of a moving some material from up here, making this a little bit more slender. 92 FS and M9 pistol are still in service today, even though the uh, M9 is being uh, is being replaced. It's still going to take some time to do that. The next version was referred to as the M9A1. Now, the M9A1 was requested by the U.S. Marine Corps. They wanted some modifications to the uh, current M9 pistol that. Uh, wasn't in their TDP, so they bought their own. Now, what's interesting about this pistol, this is not a US government M9A1. 
the M9 is the only U.S. government one because it's manufactured off their technical data package. The technical data package has every specification of the way the guns have to be shipped to the U.S. government, which also means there was a lot of updates that were made that the U.S. M9 pistol still didn't have. And there were some major ones too, like the locking block. The locking block uh, on the original one was uh, probably good for up to, up to around 10,000 rounds. The new updated ones are, up, are good up to, up to almost 20,000 plus rounds. Uh, but they couldn't use it because the U.S. government was happy with the original ones. Well, when the Marine Corps ordered the, ordered the M9A1, this was a commercial off the shelf, so they got all the updated parts. So, in essence, they were getting a more modernized gun than even the Army had. But there were some things that they wanted. The first thing they wanted was a 1913 accessory rail. They wanted to have the ability to mount a flashlight. So, they did. They wanted a more aggressive trigger guard. Now, rumor has it this was more for compliance. If they got in hand-to-hand -hand combat with it, it wouldn't... Uh, it wouldn't bend when they hit somebody in the skull or whatever with it. Uh, who knows what the Marines were thinking when they did it. And also, they wanted a better grip uh, front strap and back strap. So instead of having the standard M9-type uh, checkering on, the, on it, they went with a more aggressive with checkering rather than just the, uh, the vertical lines. And it's also the front strap and the back strap. And they also wanted to have... Uh, a better magazine so they want a magazine that would work better in the in the, in the sand so this was basically a reliability it had a, a nickel type finish on it uh, it was less likely to have any any failures to feed in the sand uh, so this was an improvement that was made so this was uh, around 2006 to present well if we notice we've gone from m9 m9a1 but we don't have an m9a2 yet well there's a reason for that because now we're going to go to the M9A3 program. Now, the M9A3 program, uh, when the U.S. government was talking about wanting a more modular pistol uh, with some better features, because Beretta was the current contractor, they had the ability to submit new guns without having to go through an open program. So they did what they referred to as the M9A3. Now, M9A3 was to Beretta M9A3. There was no U.S. government M9A3. And basically, this was their answer to the U.S. modular handgun system. So we'll see pictures of this one. I don't, don't happen to have an M9A3 here. But uh, three-slot 1913 rail. They went with a thinner Vertac grip. Um, the thinner Vertac grip allowed it to be more uh, comfortable for people with smaller hands. They had a removable wrap that they could replace the, uh, the, thin, hand, the thin hand grips with a larger one. So people with larger hands would, uh, would fit them more comfortable. Fully removable front and rear sight. So now they'd be able to replace the tritium night sights in the front, put whatever types of sights that they wanted on it. Uh, a universal slide, which could be changed from gun uh, to an F or a G model. The F model is when you decock, the safety decocks and it remains cocked. Then you can flip it up and you can have it ready to go. The G is a decock only like a SIG. So you could very easily convert that to an any 2 g or F model, whichever one that you wanted. Also, a threaded barrel, because, again, they wanted to have the ability to use sound suppressors on these new pistols as well. So they had a, a seracoated uh, threaded barrel. And also a magazine. They went with a 17-round PVD magazine, very similar to the M9A1 that held 17 rounds. So where does the M9A2 come in? Well, this was to go along with the M9A3. Because the way this pistol was made, Beretta was able to convert existing XM9s to the M9A3 configuration by replacing... The, you know, the grips by replacing the slide, uh, by replacing the barrel. And they actually had a 1913 rail that they were able to uh, weld to the frame so they could convert this you know, standard M9 into an M9A3, which was that was referred to as the M9A2. Well, the government decided against that. They decided to go with an all-open program, hence the XM17 program. Now it brings us to the most current. This is the new M9A4 put out by Beretta. Again, M9A4 as per their M9A4, not as per U.S. government. Now, what we have here is their first optics ready version of the Model 92 series. This happens to have a Delta Point Pro on here. Now, like the M9A3, this also does have the uh, two dovetailed front and rear sights so you can put on whatever you like. This also has an enhanced trigger. This has what they refer to as a enhanced short reset. So when you pull the trigger, go forward, you have a much shorter reset, making it, making it much, much more, more comfortable. And also for rapid fire, it makes it much, much better. You also have, like you have with the M9A3, 
This particular one has the uh, the wraparound version of the of the grip because again I have larger hands, so I have the I have the, I, I use this one. But they have this, this the more narrow panels they use for somebody with their shorter hands. Again, we have the threaded barrel, FDE finish, and optics ready. And this one happened to has a TLR uh, HL uh, light on it as well. So this is the current version of their M series. Now they do have a couple other versions as well. They have the uh, the 92A1 as a captive recoil spring. They also go back to the rounded frame. Uh, you have a removable front and rear sight, 17 round magazine. Um, you also have the uh, 92X, uh, which is similar to the M9A3, but a thinner Vertec and a three slot 1913 rail uh, without the threaded barrel. And I do have a couple other ones that I would like to show you too, because these are sort of special guns as well. 1994, uh, I visited Breda USA while working for Laser Max. And um, just as I was taking a class, a brand new pistol came into Breda USA. It was referred to as the 92 Brigadier. Now what the Brigadier is, it was designed for special operations or military forces where they're gonna be using higher pressure ammunition. As we can see right here, we have significant uh, increase in material on the, uh, on the slide. We also have the removable, both removable front and rear sight as well. So that goes back to the Brigadier. I thought this was the neatest thing, so I asked if they could get me one, and they got me one of the first ones that ever came into the United States. Uh, so I got that. Well, since uh, I actually had a Jarvis barrel on here, it just predated Beretta putting barrels out. And the reason why I was down there was because I was working for Laser Max, and I was working on the development of the Laser Max uh, laser sight that uh, replaced the spring guide. And that's right, as we can see right in here. So I was down there getting information in so we could get, uh, you know, just something latch release levers, uh, the forging, so we could make our uh, switches and, and, and such and getting some information. Uh, we worked with them on that project. This was a really, really neat pistol, um, and they have made several brigadiers since. The last one I'm going to show you is one that I had eyed when I was a kid working in the gun shop during college because I couldn't afford. This is referred to as the Inox. Inox is Italian for stainless steel. This is a complete stainless steel gun. It's, it's an aluminum, uh, it's aluminum frame, but this is just probably the epitome of beauty uh, of the Beretta pistols. Um, as you can see, uh, all stainless steel parts. They have uh, red dots uh, on the sights to stand out. Just this is just sort of the epitome of the beauty of Beretta. So I think what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take some of these to the range and we're just gonna see how they shoot.
Well, as you can see, all the guns uh, function flawlessly. Quite frankly, that uh, that Oldie from 1951 shot really, really well from what I was expecting. So overall, uh, the M9 history is still going and it's still going strong. Although it is being replaced by the uh, in the U.S. military, it is still used in other parts of the world. Uh, it will continue to be. Uh, I doubt we're going to see any uh, civilian versions uh, or any civilian pistols coming out of the civilian mars marksmanship program of the M9 pistol because these will be sold uh, or given away as foreign military sales or foreign military aid. But this pistol still has a lot of life in it. It still has a lot of uh, its fans. Um, and it certainly is a legacy, and it's a beautiful handgun. So I do hope you guys enjoy this video. If you do, please click like, please subscribe, and even better, share. Thank you.